Hello, and welcome to our virtual panel session called The Competitive Advantage, Paralympians in Business. This is a conversation in which we'll explore the many links between Paralympic sport and business, while also demonstrating their combined power in supporting disability inclusion. I'm Stéphane Leblois, Director of Partnerships for the Valuable 500. And joining me in this conversation are three extraordinary individuals who have each represented their countries at past Paralympic Games and who are now leading successful careers in the business world. Before we get to introductions, I'd like to add that this discussion is part of the We the 15 campaign, a movement dedicated to advancing disability inclusion across the globe through the, com through the combined power of sports and business. The Valuable 500 is honored to represent the voice of the global business community in that campaign. Without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Anna Johannes currently works as a senior account executive in marketing at Porto Novelli. She was born without a left hand and forearm and started to fight for disability rights and social justice at, at a young age. After a professional career of swimming and participating at the Paralympic Games, she took her skills from the pool to the realm of business to continue that same fight, including as the leader for the Disability Inclusion Task Force. Danny Nobbs is a corporate responsibility consultant at Aviva and currently manages their employee volunteering program across the UK and co-chairs the AvivaBility community. Following a motorbike accident in 1996, with, which left him paralyzed from the chest down, Danny was selected to represent Great Britain at the 2008 Paralympics and is the British record holder in the F-54 shot put and javelin. And lastly, Tucker Dupree is based out of Chicago and currently works at BP as the Workplace Colleague Engagement Lead of the Americas. Prior to working at BP, Tucker represented Team USA at three Paralympic Games, winning three medals in 2012 and one medal in at the 2016 Games. He holds one world record, five American records, and five Pan American records. Tucker has since retired from the sport of swimming and is impacting the world of BP. So without further ado, let's jump into our questions. So this is a question for the group. Um, as we've heard, all of you are not only top athletes, you, have also, you also have highly successful careers in business. When we think of leadership and teamwork, there are so many parallels between sport and business. A 2007 study uh, showed that athletes scored significantly higher than non-athletes in overall transformational leadership, particularly in management of self and management of feelings. How do you think that being a top athlete has prepared you for success in your professional career? And what gives you that competitive advantage? And we'll start first with Anna. Hi there, thank you so much for having me. I am a white female with brown hair. I'm in a mostly white room with a fridge, good for snacking on my left side and some pictures on my right side. I'm very excited to be here. I think being an athlete prepares you for the business world in a way that you just don't necessarily expect. It's, it prepares you for the more than 40 hour work weeks that you put in, especially you know for the three of us so dedicated to disability. It usually starts off as just volunteering and raising your hand and asking questions. And so you're able to grind through and push through what you're passionate about and really make a difference. And so being an athlete and grinding through your training is just like grinding through a 40 hour work week. It's a little bit different. It's using your mind over your body, depending, I guess, on your job. But for us, I think we're using our brains a little bit more than when we were athletes. So being able to bring those passions through is really important. What makes a difference. And we'll move on to Tucker. Hi, I'm Tucker Dupree. I'm a white male with brown hair, brown eyes. Um, I am wearing a black BP branded jumper with a office setting behind me, um, which is actually one of our trading floors for the oil industry, which is awesome. Um, and I think the biggest thing that prepared me for the corporate world coming from an athlete um, scenario is that the teamwork and understanding um, the fact that to be successful, it's really hard to do it by yourself. 
um, coming from a sport where you do swim your race. I'm a swimmer um, by yourself, unless you're on a relay and a lane alone. Um, you do realize when you stand on the podium um, that you didn't get there alone. Um, and that's something that I really do think um, has translated really well um, into my journey in corporate um, world is that just knowing that you have to have that network and the power of the network um, whenever you get into that corporate setting is really beneficial, um, but also just establishing those relationships and working cross-functionally to get your jobs done, um, as well as understanding the larger picture of um, the little successes will add up to a major success at the end um, and really understanding the planning phases as well as the actual grind that Anna mentioned before um, is really how I have been able to be successful um, within corporate America, but also just in the office setting within that transmit uh, transition between pool um, to working at a desk. Great answer. And, um, and how about, uh, how about you, Danny? Hi, I'm Danny Nobbs. Um, I'm a 41 year old white male um, with no hair and wearing a white shirt and behind me is a pale wall. So I'm slightly different to Anna and to Tucker in as much as my career at Aviva ran in parallel with my athletics career. So um, I've kind of had to learn the, the skills um, needed for both aspects of my lives in, in, in parallel. Um, I think there's a lot that I've learned from sport, which I've been able to kind of move into um, the business world. In particular, I think the perseverance and determination um, that's needed to be a top athlete and the ability to form effective and positive relationships um, is something which I've been able to bring through into the workplace. Um, I think as well, and um, I think Arno and Tucker will probably both agree, the, as an athlete, you have to be a real perfectionist. You can never settle for second best, whether it be in training or whether it be um, on the competition field or, or in the pool. So, um, yeah, but, you know, being able to kind of take that ability to kind of be a perfectionist and to really kind of analyse your performance into the workplace, I think has been um, really a useful asset um, in my day-to-day -day role. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Danny. And what I'm, what I'm hearing a little bit of in these three responses is uh, the, the importance of uh, kind of iterative work, small wins, perfectionism, looking at, you know, performing a task or, or meeting a goal, then and analyzing your performance and then, and then constantly trying to strive to be better. That's what we do in, in business. That's certainly what you, uh, you have to do uh, as an athlete to be the best. Um, so I definitely see the parallels there. Um, so I, I also, you know, there was an amazing commercial done by Channel 4 advertising the Paralympic Games that we asked each of you to have a look at prior to this conversation. It basically shows all the blood, sweat, and tears it takes to be at the very top of your game as a Paralympic, as a Paralympic athlete. And then there was a particular moment where uh, Kylie Grimes, who's a wheelchair rugby player, rolled her chair up to a, a cafe in, uh, in her local neighborhood and couldn't enter because of an inaccessible doorway. You're all Paralympians, but you also live and work in a world that's not generally designed for disabled people. Talk to us about the dichotomy of competing in the world's largest Paralympic event, and then coming back to, you know, back home or back into the workplace to face uh, barriers in your everyday life. Uh, we'll start with you, Tucker. I think the biggest thing is that understanding that this is a movement and it's gonna take time. We have to have these conversations for this to be in the spotlight for these things to change. Um, and it's not gonna happen overnight. It's, I wish it could, I wish we could flip a switch and it would be like, all right, we're, we're accessible. Um, and I think that it's also the conversation around, um, you know, once you've ticked the box that we think we're accessible, it's, it's a space that's always growing. And, and that's something that I know that all of us experience every day. Every day, We don't get the opportunity to say, I'm gonna be disabled today. Um, I'm, I'm blind all the time. And I live my life through accessible technology, whether that's my MacBook or any type of Apple product that's reading back to me um, in the workplace. But it, it's something that we have to keep having this conversation because if we don't, I think that it's gonna kind of start to fall off. And that's why I'm, I was very excited to be on this panel because it is those opportunities of realizing that, you know, a doorway not being accessible 
people that, you know, we wouldn't think about those things until we bring people in that have wheelchairs that need those accommodations. Um, and, and even from the consumer side of it, right? Consumers take products from most companies and making sure that those are accessible too. So that user journey um, is something that we can't be afraid to have that conversation um, because people outside of the workplace are, are having those conversations as well as you know experiencing things that aren't accessible. So I think that the more that we can have this in the forefront of our minds and thinking through accessible solutions throughout the project from the beginning to the end is the most important part. Um, and just making sure that it's not an afterthought, um, you know, building something or designing something. And then after you've delivered it thinking, oh wait, do we check the accessibility box? We need to have that at the beginning, you know, from actual concept of the idea to making sure that there's people in the room with disabilities helping have that conversation rather than the able-bodied community trying to think through, you know, I think this would work for the blind community. I think this would work for someone for a wheelchair. Don't think, bring them in, have them in your company, test them, test these things with these people um, is really some of the best advice I think that um, can really be had and, and not being afraid to have that conversation. Fantastic. And, and Danny, what, what, are your, uh, what are your thoughts on that question? And obviously what, what, uh, what Tucker just said. Yeah, well, firstly, I think um, that the Channel 4 ad, um, the way in which it portrayed the Paralympics, I think was, was very clever in the way that it did it, both in terms of portraying the determination and the commitment that it needs to be a top Paralympic athlete, but also just highlighting the everyday challenges that we each kind of come across um, in society. So I thought that was very, very well put across. Um, I think once you actually compete in the Paralympic Games, it, it does give you a bit of an insight um, into almost what a world would look like um, if it was sort of truly accessible. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on making sure that the, uh, the training facilities, the accommodation, the stadiums, everything kind of suits the needs of the Paralympic athletes that are there to compete. Um, but obviously, then moving back into society, things aren't, aren't like that in the real world. So um, I think what we need to really sort of bear in mind is this isn't a once every four years conversation um as as tucker mentioned this needs to be an ongoing development um an ongoing debate and and something which we continually change we continually strive to get better at um and i think we owe it not only to to our colleagues within the workplace um, but also to our customers and to society at large to actually go out there and actually make a legacy and and create help to create a world um, which is better for all of us. Great. And uh, Anna, what are your thoughts? I think there were some incredible points. The biggest problem is that every two years, people pay attention to the Paralympics and they see us thriving and living our best lives and at the peak of our abilities or disabilities. And they don't translate that. They're like, oh, they're fine they just won a gold medal. What could possibly be wrong? And then the games are over. You know, I had London as my first games and first and only <laughs> games. And it was all about the Paralympics. They really leaned in. And then I got home and people didn't even know what the Paralympics was and, or were. And so we just got back from competing and being celebrated for our athletic accomplishments, disability, disability or not. And then people don't even know what it is that you do. And so I think that's why we need campaigns and things like the We the 15 campaign is it brings attention that disability is more than the Paralympic Games. It's more than a couple people on the podium on the stage every two years. It's 1.5 or 1.2 billion people or 15% of the world's population has a disability. And that's an incredible amount. And to Tucker's point, you know, if you're not including people with disabilities at the table, I mean, A, there's so many out there that you're just not even trying. And then, you know, the, to the other point is once you do get there, you have to listen. And so I think everyone's so excited and they wanna hear the stories of Paralympians and how they got to where they are, but they don't necessarily ask like, oh, what about those paper towel holders that you literally have to have two hands to dry your hands with? You know, I think that's a hill I will die on until I see those completely discontinued, um, I'm gonna keep fighting. And then if that happens, I'll be a happy woman. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's that 
difference and people are just only want to see the positive. They only want to see the happy things. And the channel four commercial is like, no, we literally sometimes can't even get into a restaurant or the training facilities. And to Danny's point, again, the Paralympics is the epitome of everything accessibility. It's people with disabilities from all over the world celebrating and getting to know each other. And that's what has to bleed through and what people need to learn from the Paralympics and carry on more than every four or every two years. I love that. I, I especially, and Anna, just picking up on <clears throat> one of the points you mentioned there about the need for, um, uh, for, for, for campaigns like We the 15 to um, perpetuate this, this, um, this sentiment or this, you know, kind of accessibility um, explosion that seems to happen around the Paralympic Games um, every uh, for every iteration. Um, it is critically important to keep to keep the messaging ongoing to to make people uh, to get, to continually put this at the top of the agenda that thing of uh, things that people are thinking about um, that businesses are thinking about, but also the greater public um, on how to better include and and certainly welcome folks with disabilities um, uh, in in multiple areas of the community. Um, so, uh, uh, Tucker, I'm going to direct this next question at you, um, and it's uh, it's it's around coaching and, and coaching folks uh, in the workplace around around kind of disability etiquette and, and and awareness. So, every coach of a team has a guiding philosophy for how they motivate their team to work as a unit, perform to their highest ability, especially when it comes to uh, when the going gets tough. And some employ you know the all or nothing, hard nosed approach. Uh, while others may coach with love. Um, as a disabled employee of your company, I'm sure you've encountered instances um, where you've had to coach someone up on how to be more inclusive in a process or a situation. How would you describe your coaching style in those scenarios? And has your approach to uh, disability inclusion championing um, at your workplace changed over time? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, I think that the biggest thing that I try and convey um, around coaching people, around talking to people with disabilities is that people with disabilities are people. And even in that sentence of I'm a person with a disability, the word person comes first. And treating me that way is, is what I really want, right? I don't, I don't want special treatment. I don't want anything that's like better than anyone else. I just want to feel like an equal. And the biggest thing that I guess, open my eyes in um, the workforce and workplace is that as a person with a disability, I have to advocate for those needs. And sometimes people don't have that loud voice in the room or whatever that may be, but asking questions for accommodations should be weighed out in the same way that any question in the room is. And a, a great example of that is I'm 80% blind. I have 80% central vision loss. And when I go into a meeting room, I can't sit at your normal chair and see a presentation across the room. Well, I need to speak up and say to whoever's running to the meet, running the meeting, hey, could you please send over like the pre-read or the deck we're going to go through? And I don't think that that's a large question to ask. And I mean, that question gets asked in probably majority of all of our meetings. Um, but it's, it's really a simple question that I've asked into the room, but my need is to have the ability to follow along on my MacBook, as well as having headphones in so that it can read whatever is going on in the presentation. So I think that that's where the equality comes into the room of people ask for pre-reads all the time. They want to look at a graph a little bit more, whatever it may be. And, and that simple exchange is an opportunity where it's an accessible solution for me and others in the room, but also it's something that I think is harmless. And it's it's something that I wanna be, like I said, treated as an equal in that conversation. So I think the, the way to kind of just tie the bow on that whole thing is that treat people with disabilities like people. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing that I like to kind of share as a person with a disability um, is that we're not looking for something special, we're just looking for equality. Awesome. Awesome. Um, thank you for that, uh, Tucker. Um, Anna, I also have a question for you, um, and this ties back to the ideas that we had at the beginning around um, leadership and leadership in the workplace. Um, so research from EY and uh, ESPNW 
focused on how women build leadership through, uh, through sports or participation in sports. Their research so, showed that 94% of women in the C-suite played sports, 52% of women in the C-suite played at a university level, 77% of C-suite women think that women who play sports um, make good employees. Those figures are pretty, pretty amazing. And how do you think that, you know, as an athlete, how do you think that sports uh, particularly prepares women to be strong leaders? Yeah, I think this is such a good question. And reading those stats just put a huge smile on my face when you first sent them through. I was like, yeah, go ladies. Um, but yeah, I think, so the biggest thing is that from the second we're born, identities are given to us and you fit into boxes, you're pink or you're blue. And I recently saw a video of a woman who, who's, she had a girl baby, but it would dress her kind of non-binary. And when she was dressed a little bit more like a boy, people would be like, wow, look how strong you are. You're, look at you slugger, right? Like what sport are you going to play? Who's your favorite team? And then when it, the girl was dressed as a girl, it was like, oh my gosh, you're so pretty. Like, oh, look at you. And, and the tones changed immediately. And this baby was a couple months old. And so it was just ingrained within the system that we live in, but ingrained in how you're talked to as a child. And so I think, you know, being a woman in sports, you're talked to differently. And it's the same thing for disability, which I'll get into, but for women, you know, you're, you're a little bit coddled. Everyone is, you know, oh, you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to get dirty. You're going to get a paper cut, you know, um, and we're in 2021 and that's still a thing that is put on. And so when women enter, girls and women enter sports, they are competing and training with their male athletes and male teammates. I trained with Tucker just the same as uh, male and female. We, we both got our asses kicked every day up and down the pool. And so, you know, it's, you're spoken to differently. You're encouraged more. You're, you're valued more for your um, strength than for being pretty or whatever it is. And so I think sports is so important for women. And as you mentioned, I work for a nonprofit called Adaptive Sports New England. And it's even more important for people with disabilities because you're constantly told you cannot do something. You know, I was riding my bike yesterday. I didn't have a prosthetic. So a lot of people were staring at me and they're like, oh, can you do this? I was like, I'm on the bike. You can see me doing it. I'm fine. Thank you. But you're constantly told no and stared at and just assumed that you can't do the normal things. But when you're in the pool, it's the same thing or on the track or weightlifting or javelin or whatever it is, you're always told you can do more and can do better. And when you have that mindset, it, it, it just changes everything. And I think the power of sport, even if you don't go to the Paralympics, but just being able to be in that environment is incredible. And I do want to point out, you know, this is a panel of all white people, right? I am a white woman. I don't know the levels of being a woman of color within that, but it's the same thing, like being able to be empowered beyond your identity and just focus on what your body can do at all times is really an incredible thing. So yeah, those stats aren't surprising and they're really encouraging. And I hope to see more about Paralympians and Paralympic women and Paralympic women of color and all the things. So yeah, I, I love that question and thank you for bringing that up. And your, you know, I, I really love both the, the combination of both you and Tucker's responses to, to your questions here because they kind of point to sports, um, general ability or the potential to be a great equalizer and to be a great, you know, uh, driver of equity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, obviously we all have a way to go and, you know, sport has a way to go to be more inclusive and, and more accessible and, and more equitable. Um, but the potential is there, you know, as, as a coach of a, a mixed ability rugby team, I'll tell you that I treat my players as rugby players, they're not individuals with disabilities that happen to play rugby. No, that you know, and 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 so I'm really, I I really love your answer to that, Anna and and, and Tucker as well. I think that's wonderful. And so the next um, the next question is for Danny. Um, and Danny, I was I was wondering. So as you know, um, we at the Valuable Five Hundred, we work with a collective of businesses on an ongoing basis to 
inform, inspire, and motivate them to be more inclusive, more inclusive to people with disabilities. And that's not just uh, their employees, but their customer bases, their leadership, um, basically all stakeholder groups that they would touch. Um, the Paralympics is a great time for businesses to show support for the disabled community, but it only happens every four years. What would your message be to business leaders, both as a Paralympian, but also as somebody working in a business that, and living with a disability? What would you like to see um, in terms of change and how do you think businesses should approach making that happen? So, yeah, thank you. And, and what a great question. Um, it's one that I could probably talk about for ages, but um, in terms of speaking to business leaders about where they can maybe start, I think it depends upon where they are in their, their journey um, around dis disability inclusion. Um, and for those that are maybe in the earlier stages of the journey, it's probably not to be overwhelmed or even ashamed of where you are currently. Um, is to put a positive spin on it. Just look at the potential um, that's there to go out and, and make a difference both to your workforce, to your customers and to society as a whole. But to draw parallels um, into sport, um, both um, Anna and, and Tucker will be um, very aware that in training and in your performance, you're always trying to find those marginal gains, those fractions of a percent that make you better, make your performance the best that it can possibly be. So I'd actually urge the business leaders to actually go out and, and to look across your business um, as broad as it may be, and just to go and see where you can not necessarily just focus on, on the, the real big wins, but just look at the, the small things that you can change. Because if you do that across your business, they soon um, accumulate to a, to a bigger change um, and to really make a difference. And I think as well, kind of adding on to that is the ability to kind of reach out. So don't just kind of um, stay within within silos. Don't just look within your own business. Reach out, learn from each other, other organisations, and collaborate to actually make um, a, a legacy and um, to really, I guess, value um, the diverse and inclusive workforce that you could have. Because ultimately, um, by better reflecting the societies in which we live, you're going to be able to um, build better products, be able to service your customers in the right way. Um, and that can only end up in commercially um, being a, a better outcome uh, for everybody. And, and Anna, Tucker, any reactions to that? Uh, Tucker, uh, we'll start with you. And then Anna, if you have any reactions to that. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that it's just making sure that you're, you're being inclusive and really bringing in people that look like the consumers that consume your products from a commercial side of it um, and, and not being afraid to have the conversation. Um, I, I think a big thing that Anna's reference about riding a bike, um, you know, people that we've traveled the world with um, and seen how societies interact as Paralympians, um, you know, people, when I tell them I've lost 80% of my vision um, at the age of 17, like the immediate reaction is like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I all automatically like correct that and say like, please don't, don't be sorry. Like I've done more without vision than I would have ever dreamed of doing sighted. And that is really comes down to the fact that it's a choice that, you know, we as Paralympians made um, to really say like, hey, I want to go to sports. I want to do something um, to which one will become a new identity, but also it's a great opportunity to experience accessibility, you know, to the best ability. And we've seen really accessible environments. We've traveled the world and seen places that aren't so accessible. And I think that's something that a lot of us try and encompass when we go in new places, do things as think through our teammates that we've traveled with and say like, oh, could Anna pull this paper towel out? No. And that's okay. And I think that that's where it really comes down to is, you know, kind of failing quickly to have that opportunity to pivot and make it right and do the right thing to make your environments more accessible for people and, and have that opportunity to say like, we're always growing. It's something we're always learning and we're always trying to be better at. Um, and it's going to take time. It's going to take time. And I cannot stress that enough um, because we're in a movement and we're trying to make this a better more accessible world for people like all of us on this call. Awesome. And uh, Anna, you want to bring it home? I'll try my best. Yeah, I think these are incredible points. I think the biggest one too is just don't wait to have someone with a disability have to ask 
for accommodations, right? I, when I first entered the job that I am now, there were so many little things. The doors didn't have accessibility buttons on it. So for me, like, yes, I have one hand and can pull it out, but if I'm holding a coffee, I'm gonna struggle with that door real quick for sure. And so there was just so many things and it was, they were like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. And that's fine and that's great, but don't wait for someone to have to tell you like, this is inaccessible, you're inaccessible. And so being able to be proactive about that and then also the biggest one too, is don't assume that you're just gonna get one disabled person. Uh, we are looking at a new office space for again, the company that I work for and they had one accessible bathroom. And if they had an, someone in a wheelchair and someone who was non-binary, they would have to synchronize their bathroom schedules to be able to use this one bathroom option. So being able to be inclusive means not just assuming you may or may not have someone from the LGBTQIA community or the disability community or whatever it is and being intersectional about that as well. So there's just so much to consider with that. And, you know, as we've said, it does take time and it, it can be a big bite into this world, but you gotta start somewhere. So ask the questions, you know, what, what do we need to change and why not? change, right? I think those are some of the questions that you have to ask yourself to enter into this space and really make your business accessible and inclusive for anyone. Amazing, uh, amazing answer. And the, the one thing I'll, <clears throat> I'll add is um, during a webinar I attended recently, um, somebody had mentioned that one of the greatest sources for inspiration for any business leader who's trying to uh, uh, either start at the beginning, right, in their disability inclusion journey or continue to build is listen to your employees, especially your employees with disabilities, right, um, or your consumers with disabilities if you have a feedback, if you have a way to garner that feedback. It is critically important to, you know, to, to hear those voices and to make sure those voices are included in the planning process, because if they're not, you end up designing tools or you end up designing interventions that may not necessarily work for those audiences. So, engage with empathy and make sure you listen and, and you're open to that feedback as well. To Tucker, uh, what, what Tucker mentioned earlier, be okay in having that uncomfortable conversation, right? Um, that's, that's a very big key to, to getting better. So uh, I want to move on to our last question, um, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, delves into um, the issue of uh, mental health. Um, so, uh, Simone Biles' uh, decision to withdraw from the Olympics shined a light on a typically overlooked subject in sport, which is mental health and the toll that uh, the near constant spotlight can have on Olympians. The COVID-19 pandemic has also brought about conversations on mental health, social isolation, and self-care. Companies are thinking differently about how to promote their employees' well-being, especially in, increasing, uh, especially in an increasingly virtual work environment. What are your thoughts on the changing conversation openness about mental health and disability in the workplace? How do you think people should be advocating for their needs and how do you think companies should be responding? And uh, Anna, we'll start with you and work our way around the room. Yeah, this is such an important subject matter to discuss. I've, um, I, I have serotonin tattooed onto my arm because I've actually struggled very much with depression and uh, wouldn't be here today without some incredible uh, systems. And I think there's a couple things. One, mental health is part of the disability community. You know, people don't understand that having dyslexia or having depression or anxiety, that's part of the 1.2 billion people on this planet and deserves to be talked about and deserves to have accessibility to it. And so I think some of the things that companies need to consider, and it's very similar to physical disabilities as well, when you have to advocate for yourself. Sometimes with me, like I said, with like the paper towel thing, it's like, I get that. Okay, yeah, we can fix that. But when it's something like an invisible disability, right? With, um, you know, looking at us now, we, you may not know some of the other things. I have nerve damage in my hand and had to ask for a keyboard that, I didn't have big buttons because I literally couldn't press with my pinky and they questioned me about it. Uh, and so I think it's the same thing with mental disabilities and mental health and neurodiverse people is that you don't need to be, or excuse me, 
company shouldn't question that when you're advocating, you're like, you know what, like Simone Biles did, she was like, I am not doing well. I need to take care of me. I need to protect my body and who I am mentally and physically. And she drew that line in the sand and people might've questioned it, but thank goodness the team supported her. And I think companies need to do that as well. We've all been through Helen back in the past year and a half with the pandemic and especially people with disabilities. You know, I think something like two thirds of the deaths that happened in the UK were people with disabilities because there wasn't that advocacy network. And so now with mental health, it's the same thing when an employee or um, even a manager is like, I need to take a mental health day. I am, you have to listen and not question it. And so I think that's, what's really important to that conversation. Like uh, Simone Biles has brought up. Mm -hmm. And um, Danny, let's hear from you. Yeah, and I think where a sports person or anyone in society, I think it's important to, to reinforce that um, mental health doesn't exclude anybody and it can happen to, to anybody at any time. So um, I think obviously the, the pandemic over the last 18 months has kind of really piled on heaps of pressure onto everybody. Um, and I think it has um, yeah, taken its toll on, on so many. Um, but I think we have responsibilities, both as individuals and within business, to kind of really care for each other and, and to look out for each other. And I think that's never been more important than it than it is currently. Um, and I think probably just um, mentioning just over the last 18 months and, and certainly what I found with working for Aviva, that we, we've certainly had very much a, a people first culture. Um, and it's made been made very clear to us that whatever we need in order to make sure that we maintain um, positive mental health, um, that, that we're able to do that. So whether it be flexible working patterns, whether it be reinforcing the importance of workplace passports, for example, um, taking wellbeing days, employee assistance programs, all of these materials um, have kind of been put at our disposal um, just to make sure that we are able to be as um, kind of in balance, if you like, um, as, we, as we possibly can be. Um, but also to make sure that we don't forget to give the tools and the materials to, to the people leaders, because it's all very well speaking to, to the individuals and the point that they need the support, but it's important that we get um, the, the people leaders, the tools and the training that they need to actually identify um, individuals when they need support at the earliest opportunity. Um, so um, yeah, really proud of what we've done at Aviva um, over the last 18 months. Awesome, thank you for that, uh, Danny and uh, Tucker, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I can follow those two. Um, I think the biggest thing, um, just kind of the, the last build on, on all of this is that um, I'm gonna just go back to the, the tagline that I've been using is that we're people first, whether it's a disability or whatever it is, like we all wanna be treated like people and stuff on the, the little piece of lead with empathy, um, I think is one of the biggest things to kind of take away is that, it's okay not to be okay. And it's, you got to kind of voice that. Um, and it's, it's something as well, I think to, um, from the receiving side of it, um, is to realize that we don't, we don't always know what's going on with everyone in their situations. So when you lead with empathy and you have that opportunity to treat people, um, with equality and care, I think that's what really matters the most. And something at BP that I'm very, very, um, fortunate, um, to have is that one of our core values is one team. And um, I would say that our teams are very strong in taking care of each other and checking in on each other. If you do have, you know, a mental health day or whatever that may be, or you need a break. Um, and that balance of work-life balance is something that we're working on as a company um, and we're learning as well. And we're trying different models out and trying to figure out what that looks like for the future um, of our business. Cause I think COVID has kind of shown all of us that flexibility is something that is not something we can try. It's something we have to do. Um, so I think that, there's been so many phenomenal pieces of just like sound bites from this panel that uh, I'm going to take back with me and really help um, kind of tell that story at BP, but also um, just really always having in mind that we're people first and um, let's treat each other that way. And what a great way to kind of wrap our discussion today. Uh, we're people first, right? Um, and engage with empathy, I think is, is such a, such a huge thing. And we've heard 
incredible sound bites, incredible stories from three incredible individuals who have um, who have uh, graced us with uh, with their presence today amid a, a busy work week, I'm sure. Um, but uh, but thank you to our thank you to our panelists for this wonderful conversation. I'll remind the audience again that. Um, this conversation is part of the We the 15 campaign. If you want to find out more about We the 15, go to wethe15.org. That's we the 15.org. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at Stefan Leblois um, at the valuable 500.com, Stefan.leblois at the valuable 500.com. Um, and that's it for us. Uh, thanks so much to everybody and thank you for tuning in. And um, I guess we'll we'll catch you, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Ciao, everybody.